Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll here so you guys can have a chance to participate. Welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us for the second webinar in the Ditch the Textbook webinar series here. Um, as you guys who may have joined in September will probably know, this is a way for you guys to learn actionable insights and solutions into those daily challenges that you and your team are facing, knowing that there's quite a few, um, and specifically around the day-to-day -day business operations that textbooks really can't provide you, knowing that textbooks are still a very important part of learning and training. But maybe there's those little things like enhancing your operational processes that aren't necessarily um, in a textbook. So we're here to help talk through that here in this series. Um, and we look forward to having you guys on the next three after this, um, every, Wednesday, every third Wednesday of the month at noon central. So thank you guys for joining us, uh, sharing your, your lunch with us. If you're central time, if you're not, thank you for adapting to that schedule. Um, and as we wait for a few more to join in here, I'll give you guys a little bit of background. But my name is Elizabeth Hansen. I am marketing campaign manager here at Interplay Learning. And I'm your moderator and host today. So I'll be moderating the polls, the chats, anything that you guys want answered live, I can definitely do that. Otherwise, if we don't get to it live, we have a Q&A portion at the end, or we'll certainly follow up with you via email after. Um, but please take a second to answer the poll in the chat, and we'll be popping up a few, you know, sound off in the chats throughout the um, participation and throughout the webinar today so that you guys all have a chance to fully participate because those of you that do in three out of five of them will get a $75 gift card of your choice. Um, so just as a reminder, today we are talking with Tim Smith on how to enhance your administrative operational processes that can cause you to attract skilled technicians and skilled workers knowing that that's a, a big pain point now. Um, but before we get into that, just a second of housekeeping, just a reminder for those of you that we're on the last one. And if you didn't make it to that one, thank you for joining us today, but you will be muted for the duration of the webinar. So if you have questions, send those in the question box or in the chat, and we'll make sure that those get answered live or in the Q&A portion. Um, as well as that, you'll receive a webinar replay link within 24 hours of this webinar. So be on the lookout in your email inbox for that tomorrow. Awesome. So now we're getting into the good things now that we've gotten through the housekeeping, if you will. Um, joining us today on the webinar is Tim Smith. Tim Smith was a student in the HVAC program at Hudson Valley Community College. Um, he really found that field interesting, challenging, and excelled at it. So after he worked in the field for a number of years, he actually returned to teach at his alma mater, and he served as a senior professor for 30 years before retiring in 2019. He also operates a successful HVAC training and consulting company and now helps shepherd technicians through actually interplay learnings, VR and 3D HVAC learning model modules. So we are very lucky to have him here. Um, he believes that HVAC professionals truly that truly excel are those who at their core are good communicators, able to relate to customers, possess good reading comprehension and math skills, and are consummate professionals. So most of all, he believes that great technicians are at their core problem solvers. And I think that's a really great blurb. And I wanted to make sure I read it for you guys, just knowing that we're going to touch on a lot of those pieces throughout this conversation in how you can become a really good um, technician. And then as a business, how you can grab those really good technicians too. So just a little preview on what you guys might get into. And with that being said, in today's discussion, we're going to touch on those major pain points in hiring and attracting skilled workers, ways training that lowers that hurdle towards competency for students, and then how Tim has really seen businesses attract skilled workers that have come out of his program. He's going to speak to using technology in his program um, and what has worked and what hasn't when it comes to grabbing those really uh, skilled technicians that have come out of his training program. So we are excited to have him. And Tim, thank you so much for spending the lunch hour with us, knowing that thank it's a little you. bit later in the day for you. Thank you. It's fun. Cool. So we will hop right in. Um, so I know we just touched on something that you guys are all very aware of. Um, hiring across all industries, not just trades, is a pain right now. Um, but especially in the skilled trades, I think I read somewhere that we're going to have, you know, 370,000 open skilled trades positions by 2028. So there is just a lack of resources in the industry. Um, given that I know that businesses are really facing an uphill battle and there's a ton of challenges, Tim, what would you say are some of those driving challenges that you've seen in the industry and like 
maybe that you hear every day from businesses or that you heard from students that were trying to get into the business world after graduating that we, we, uh, we hear every day. It's, it's really good to be an employee these days as opposed to an employer because it's really hard to find skilled people. Most of the graduates from my program had multiple offers and uh, we had a limited number of students. We graduated about 70 students, 60 to 70 a year. Um, so there were a lot of companies that just weren't able to hire out of there. And there were things they needed to do to improve that. And, we, and they did, they did in fact do that over, over time, but there, it's a big challenge now. Um, like they say, it's, it's tough to find enough people. You're never going to be out of work in this field. <laughs> yeah. I think something that was interesting to me that we talked about on Monday too, um, kind of speaking to, you know, the pains, the uncontrolled costs that come with not having those skilled technicians that you need, or maybe not getting them up to competency fast enough was first of all, how do we even get um, the younger generation interested in the skilled trades as a profession, knowing that sometimes there is maybe um, a lack of understanding of what comes into the skilled trades, what's exciting about the skilled trades and why people closer to my age should be interested in going into that field. I think in the past, um, and, and that's changing, there's been, a, there's been a stigma associated with skilled trades, particularly in education, um, pushing pushing students towards an academic path as opposed to the skilled trades path. Um, again, that's changing. Um, I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest hurdle there. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the general consensus of the poll that I just ran, where do you see the biggest challenge in attracting skilled talent? Also 41% of our audience agrees the interest levels and careers in the industry. And I think that that's a real disservice just given that I know we were talking about how exciting things can be. Like you're not ever doing the same thing when you're you're going out on the field. You've got tons of different opportunities to do tons of different things. Um, and I think that that's a disservice and we need to get to a point where we can enhance that. Um, so kind of with that being said, knowing that I've, I've prepped for this one, um, and you have a super unique perspective because you, you've been a professor for so long and I have learned so much in talking to you. Um, but as you've grown students yourself in the industry, what would you say um, are your biggest takeaways from teaching skilled workers and in, you know, seeing businesses try to attract them when they were in the classroom? So like, what have you seen from the perspective of um, knowing hiring is hard, but how do we get those students to a point of wanting to be hired or to a point where they're they're easily hired because they're just so competent. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is just more speak to your experience in the classroom. Um, well, we uh, kind of used a hodgepodge of theory and lecture courses and then hands-on laboratory learning. Um, our students received, I think, 750 hours of hands-on training with that two-year degree. And then we, um, even prior to COVID, we had implemented um, simulation training with Interplay, and uh, that provided a great bridge um, between the lecture or theory courses and the laboratory. And I found myself spending a lot less time in the laboratory orientating, orientating students to equipment and covering safety because that, that bridge in between really provided a lot of that. And that, that allowed the students to spend more quality hands-on time, I guess, in the, in the laboratory. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I will hop in now since you brought it up with safety. I know that safety was a big takeaway from just our initial lead up to this conversation. Um, safety is a huge part of anything when it comes to skilled trades. It's huge when it comes to being an HVAC. It's huge when it comes to plumbing, electrical, like it's in everything. Um, because not only obviously do we want our employees to say stay, whoa, to stay safe, we also want in turn businesses to remain um, in a positive light. And I know you kind of actually had an anecdote when it came to that. And would you be willing to share? If you can clue me into what that anecdote was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. At least so, spoke about so many things on the safety end of it. I know, I know. And feel free to jump in and share any of them. But <laughs> specifically, I think I remember you mentioning that um, you had seen a business in the HVAC industry 
possibly in New York, possibly geographically located somewhere else that yeah. had um, a technician that had more of like a safety issue or had gotten injured on the job, which obviously we don't want to see happen to anybody from an employee perspective, like our employees come first and employee safety is first. But then it also became an issue when it came to reviews for that employer. And I thought that that was a really interesting note that you made um, because it was eye-opening that not only we need our employees to be safe, but we need them to be safe because it tarnishes our business too really does it reflects very poorly on on the employer i think when a you know some would imply maybe they're not um providing proper safety training for their employees um and then of course you've got to deal with osha and then other organizations here in new york um so yeah i think safety is really really important especially these days just for again not just for the personal safety of the technician but the liability of the of the company as well. I agree. And I'm about to get ahead of myself, so I'll, I'll pause, but I, I want to also jump in and make sure that we talk to um, safety that you've seen in your classroom as well, knowing that you were able to use interplay learning and just technology in general, specifically during COVID, but also during the last 10 years in your, your career, or I guess 30, but specifically with interplay the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, use it to actually benefit which students you gave greater notice to when it came to, maybe they need a little bit more help here and allowed you that time to do so. I think that's a a big piece. I agree that by, uh, you know, using online learning and particularly simulation and having that bridge between the two, Again, I spent less time on safety in the laboratory. It also freed up time to where my students that didn't require as much supervision at that point, um, maybe they had a little experience in the field or their family owned a business, so they're a little bit familiar with it. Um, They could kind of fly by the seat of their pants and just go. And I could that freed me up to spend more time with the students who needed more of my help. And, you know, particularly in the safety area, (laughs) kind of keep an eye. There's a multitude of hazards in HVAC. Um, you know, high voltage electricity, you know, cryogenic fluids, combustible fuels, sharp edges, um, headbangers, as we call them, um, you know, overhead pipes, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, that that really allowed me to not just minimize the safety training in the laboratory because, you know, the interplay uh, sims actually implemented a lot of that in the sims. But again, free up my time for the students who really, really needed the help. And that, that allowed me to raise the bar, I feel, in the in the laboratory. It allowed me to bring, you know, instead of bringing everybody to, I guess you say, the lowest common denominator, as they actually bring bring everybody up. Using yeah, that. I agree. It was actually not a conversation that we had. It was a conversation I had internally with someone else yesterday. But I think it kind of fits into what we're talking about here, um, where I think a really big benefit of implementing technology into your classroom, not saying like that's the only piece you need. You obviously need hands-on training. You need to you dive into the safety code and all of that, but being able to implement technology in some level into trade schools and into training um, allows you as an instructor to really do what you are passionate about, which is instruct and like be a mentor versus having to be concerned about what's my lesson plan going to be tomorrow. And I thought that that was an interesting note and feel free to jump in and say yes or no. That's actually how I felt. I I agree. I mean, I embrace the technology. I I was a, that was a, professor for 30 years and I saw the transformation in education from using overhead transparencies (laughs) to what we have now. We have document cameras and, you know, obviously using web-based programs and things. And I I embrace that technology. Not all um, seasoned, I'll say, professors embraced the technology, but I, but I did. I felt like it made my job a lot, a lot easier and it benefited my students, which was the more important thing. Yeah. And I actually think that 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 speaks to we have a couple notes I want to bring up in the chat. But before we get to that, um, I think that really speaks to what you were notating earlier and why I want to bring back and hone in on your bio a little bit on why technicians are all great problem solvers. Um, I loved on Monday when you brought up we need to teach technicians how to learn to learn. 
um, which is a little bit repetitive, but if you don't know how to learn, you can't be successful in the real world because growing up, you're just set told to go do this, to go digest this, but never really taught how to take that one step further and problem solve. And that's like the real world and specifically in the HVAC world where things are changing every day. It's super imperative. Yeah, the type the the technology that's coming out and the equipment is just evolving so fast. I always say that, you know, the last three to five years, the industry's changed more than it did in the previous twenty five years. And that, that you could say that at any point. I think um, that's that's a uh, a big deal to. Um, I'm, Big deal Word. just in general. I think it's a big yeah. deal when it comes to people my age. I think it kind of goes back to possibly that unfortunate stigma around the trades, um, which shouldn't be there because I think if if we had had the conversation we had on Monday, I'd be like, I want to be in the trades. Like, I think it sounds like a super exciting and um, validating career path, but it's just not something that is kind of shared in that sense. And I think that that's one way to grab, at least from my perspective, the people my age um, who are glued to our phones 24 seven and have grown up with just technology in front of our face. It's kind of that gamification aspect. Um, and I want to point out Carlos Lozano. He made a good point to the two of us that um, having the gaming industry impact the HVAC industry has allowed the tools to utilize technology in the future and today. So I think that that's a really good piece on how we can keep engaging people and how we can keep people interested so that there are those skilled students to attract into businesses, because that is a big part of it. We're, the industry is suffering in trying to attract skilled workers because there's just not enough of us, enough of the industry. Go oh, back to that learn to learn statement. That's extremely important. You're going to learn fundamentals. You're going to be able to have to adapt to new equipment that comes out. Not you know, reading comprehension is very important. You're going to need to be able to comprehend manufacturers, installation and operation manuals, because every piece of equipment has their own little nuances in them. Um, and your fundamentals are going to provide you with a lot, but you're going to need to be able to, to read through those and, and comprehend that and understand it. You're not going to be able to call for help every time. <laughs> you can do that once in a while, especially if you're new tech, you can call for help, but it, you know, after you don't a while, always you know, want to. No, you don't, you don't. I feel like it, it kind of goes back to the conversation for those of you that were on the first one that we had with Krista, who was fabulous. And I was happy to have her talking kind of to the stress of new individuals on site and also the stress of businesses with training and the cost of implementation and all of that. Um, there's just a lot of stress right now. And some, sometimes taking out that barrier to questions is really helpful. Great. So with that being said... Um, I know we've touched on, you know, feeling the skills gap across the country and in the past, it has been less transparent just because of the lack of trans technology of where jobs might be across the country. There's, and I, we spoke to this on Monday, but there's so many different opportunities in the industry that people just don't know about because of the geographical spread or because it wasn't highlighted. Um, and I think it kind of goes to the second challenge of that poll that, I think got the second amount is just people don't know what jobs are available. Um, I think it's getting easier with technology, but I know that with geographical spread and that additional level of competition when it comes to skilled workers, that's a challenge. Um, can you speak specifically to how maybe online learning and just technology in general has helped that attraction and, you know, maybe some of those niche audiences that are super exciting? Well, I think in the early days, um, the online, one of the online products I used from Interplay actually had companies recruiting right off. The, we had a leaderboard on there. So as the, these were simulations, HVAC simulations, I think there were seven in total at the time. Um, that was a number of years ago now. Um, I'm going to guess it was six or seven years ago anyways. And um, we had larger, particularly larger companies um, such as Carrier and Train that actually were the student could set their profile up as public or private. So if they set it up as public, these companies could then go in and look at these students' performance on that online um, program and see how they were doing. And some of my students were employed based on that <laughs> by these companies. So it's pretty interesting there. 
That's really cool. Yeah. I don't I think we actually talked about it on Monday, so I'm happy to. Yeah, that was a, I, I'm not sure that's still available, but it was in the early stages of the simulation, the online simulation with Interplay. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the students didn't want, you know, they set their profiles as private. They didn't want to, you know, be bothered with that. But um, I did, in fact, have at least a couple that were, that were hired by Carrier, actually Carrier Corporation. Cool. Over there, cool. and they're one of the big guys, you know, in our industry, one of the big players. Yeah, I appreciate those insights. Um, mm-hmm. I know you also mentioned that with technology, there is in like insights into just being able to be hired off of job boards. There's insights into being able to move because you see those jobs. But um, can you speak to some of those opportunities that maybe even those in the room may not know exist in? The yeah, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of niche markets. Most of the students that I saw coming in had the impression that upon graduation they were going to be in a service van or a service truck, and they were going to be driving around from service call to service call. When I graduated, um, I worked for a while as a refrigeration mechanic, but then I I got into the clean room business, and I certified and commissioned clean rooms, um, which is a real specialty market. And there's a lot of those. Healthcare facilities tend to be specialty. Uh, supermarket refrigeration is is very proprietary. Um, as well as I had a student that was hired by one of the major cruise lines um, to work on a cruise ship. And that's something that that's the one I was excited most about. of the students don't think about that. And uh, when, you know, when he was relaying this to his fellow students that he he got this job with this cruise line, they're like, wow, I never even thought of, you know, applying to, to that. <laughs> but with the, there are a lot of, uh, you know, seen it over 30 years. What we've got now is you have job banks on the web that are just you know wide open i mean there's actually some that are just hvac job banks there's a couple of them out there um so the students have a lot more opportunities to seek out jobs i think now than they did when i was when i started when we we didn't even really have the the internet or cell phones or any of that stuff is uh so i've seen that transformation and i think it's uh, i think it's wonderful actually because it just opened their eyes to what's actually out there it's not just getting in that van and driving around um you could pretty much do what you want if you want to work in house in a manufacturing facility or in a you know a healthcare facility and you want more of a i say more of an a, eight to four and nine to five job that's fine if you don't want that you want to be out in that service van driving around and um having a little bit of variety which some people like really like that that's fine too but there's a lot of opportunities i think that they don't they don't see initially i agree i like that jesse added a few here for us um healthcare facilities within the commercial space mixed use and residential zoned areas we have the oil industry so several coming through all things that I didn't think of. I, that one, the cruise ship one was the one that got me. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're yeah. literally getting paid to travel in the trades. And that's really cool. And that's not something that maybe we highlight enough. Um, but I, I guess I didn't think of, I didn't think of the oil industry because I live in the uh, upstate yeah, New York and, and we are oil here and it's always been oil where I live. Well, we won't have natural gas or anything here for a long time. So been burning fuel oil for a long, long time. And I just kind of, I don't really think of that as a niche market anymore because I guess I grew up and, and worked on, on oil equipment for most of my life. So. Agreed. Definitely a, an interesting one. Um, but we will shift gears here a little bit, knowing that obviously there's um, ways to enhance your students' training. There's ways to really get into the trades and utilize technology when it comes to getting up to competency, you know, bridging that gap to competency and hands-on training. Um, but let's, let's shift focus a little bit towards, you know, where businesses might be able to grab those students that come out of the classroom and what you've seen from your experience and places there might be some room for improvement when it comes to um, students deciding between offers, knowing that a lot of times a lot of um, skilled tradespeople, whether they're coming out of trade school or they're just in entering the industry for themselves, have options. I have great relationships with all of the HVAC contractors and companies in my area. I've fostered those relationships over a 30 or 35 year period. And when they're doing something, I don't want to say it's wrong. It's just they're overlooking something and they're not able to hire one of our, you know, one of our better graduates or one of the graduates from the program. I let them know, you know, why that was um, so that they can improve on that. 
I think probably the biggest one is that they don't spell out a, a career path. You know, every every candidate is unique in pursuing their own personal goals, basically. Um, and they want an employer, you know, who's going to aid in that in the form of training and certification, uh, as well as promotions. So if the candidate doesn't see a clear path, they're going to seek out an employer who who supports their future, I guess, is the the other thing. Now, the salary has has gotten a lot better in the HVAC uh, industry over the last number of years. When I first started working, I thought it was um, very, very low low compared to the skill level that was required but that that's come around but there's other things that you can do besides salary i've noticed that a lot of students upon graduation will take a lower salary if there's benefits and perks you know if they have multiple offers and your offer isn't as high as somebody else there's other ways to sway them it could be things like sign on bonuses uh free gym memberships is another one that i see companies offer uh even life insurance policies you know um, those are all good, you know, good benefits, um, that can attract employees, even if the salary is on the low side. And I would say a majority of my graduates over the years, um, would definitely take lower money if there were other, other things to sweeten the pot, so to speak. <laughs> I agree. I know we'll get into those in a second, but I think the big one, uh, apologize if you're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, I think a big one really is, that career growth path. Um, I know from my perspective, being probably around the age of, or maybe a little bit older, but around the age of probably a lot of those students that, or you know, people entering the industry that those businesses are trying to attract for those green level technician roles, is that we're big on knowing what comes next and knowing how to get to that next stage in our career, um, whatever that may look like, but knowing that we wanna learn um, and we want to learn to know how to be better at what we're doing. And I think that that was a good point that you made is that that's an opportunity cost. Maybe it comes at the cost of X, Y, Z amount of salary, but you're getting a better path to where I can go. Um, and it's kind of jumping ahead. We'll get to it in a second, but I know it, it okay. kind of comes back to the training or competition piece too. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, that's, that's always an issue. The, uh, that's not a, you know, it's become less of a problem now, but it used to be a big problem where a company would provide a lot of training for an, a new employee. And, you know, six months later, that employee walks out the door for a dollar more an hour with their competitor. Um, and I had companies complain to me that they felt like they were training their competition. Um, there are, basically training contracts now with most of the companies if the training is extensive and it's expensive um you know if you leave the position prior to a given period of time um you have to reimburse them for the training in some cases Thanks. and i know even the, even though you know the pipe fitters um we have local seven pipe fitters here same thing if you withdraw during your apprenticeship you can be billed for the for the training so that 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 stopped some of that from happening definitely um i want to highlight mark's comment in the chat because it's a great one um he notes that businesses need to engage with local school systems and support career and technology education that feeds their industry and i think that is a really really good point and kind of comes into what we're talking about today um in your students you're that central trades school, if you will, um, that all of those businesses were looking to attract. So you need to be honed in as a business owner or as um, a large scale industry business, be honed in on where where those people and those um, trades people are that you want to attract. Um, I don't think you can wait for trades people to come to you anymore. I think you have to go to where they are. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think I think some of it, a majority of my students were actually working uh, internships and part time for a company in their second year. And when they graduated, they typically are hired full time by that company. So the company kind of got a taste for what their abilities were and, and what they could do and their attitudes, as well as their communication skills, which is obviously important. And so the, the 
the companies got to try out the student per se, and the student got to try out that per- particular job title, <laughs> whether yeah. it be a service technician or installer or whatever it happened to be. So I think that's beneficial. And I think that um, a lot of companies can also look to serve on advisory boards for these programs. Um, we relied heavily on our advisory board members. Uh, there is comprised of local um big players in the HVAC industry um, at all levels. And they they didn't you know dictate what we were teaching, but they gave us an insight to what we really should be, what the outcome should be for our students, for them to be successful with their company. So we, we relied on that and, and adopted a lot of those things for them, particularly the safety end of it. That was going back to that. That's a that's a big one now here. Yeah. And I think that Mark's next comment on how companies need to continue to invest in their employees, um, complete their apprenticeships, increase their skilled value to the company. I agree. When good employees leave, it's usually because a company has failed to provide opportunity. I think that that kind of ties into where we wanted to speak with communication barriers and that lack of training. So I know that you've spoken with me about how you've seen in the industry, maybe there's Uh, a more experienced technician that has to speak to a a greener technician and train them, but maybe they don't love training. Maybe they just aren't as amazing a communicator, whatever that may be. Like sometimes that path is lost to learning. Um, Could you speak to that a little bit for us? Yeah, I see that a lot where, um, and I think the companies just need to do a better job of, of having the experienced technician that's training these newer hires. Um, the right person just because you're a great hvac technician does not necessarily mean you're a communicator and i i listen to students all the time on internships some of the texts they worked with they absolutely loved they were great they taught them so many so many things and then others um they felt like they they were resented by the by the technician and uh you know, gave them a hard time, made them do go for work, as we call it, go for this, go for that, you know, Um, saw that a lot. Um, I think that's up to the companies to really find the best of the best that they have for technicians when it comes to communication, not just throw a a, a new hire indiscriminately with a tech, with an experienced tech, but utilize the technicians that, you know, that can communicate more to train these people. I think, We also talked about how there needs to be a little bit of incentive that comes with it too um, in any sales organization so that this can relate to anyone that may not be hands-on in the trades too and just more of a high-level individual on the the call. Um, I think to a general sales organization, like if you're asking someone to onboard and train an employee, it's taking up a lot of their ability to make whatever commission they could be making. And that's similar when it comes to a lot of... um, you know, tradespeople, HVAC technicians, plumbing that have to go out on calls and maybe they get commission on those calls too. So by taking that path Thank to, you. I, I need to train this green greener level technician, you're taking away that time that maybe they had to make more money for themselves too. So I think that there's that piece that we just have to be cognizant of as business professionals maybe provide a premium for those technicians that are really good communicators and do a great job of training um, in addition to their salary, maybe provide them some kind of perk for doing that. It's probably a good idea. It would encourage them to, you know, to impart what they know to these, these, other, these newer technicians um, and not necessarily, I see some that have a real problem with the younger technicians coming out. They just feel like it's a pain in the neck and it's making their day harder. But, so maybe they need to be compensated and that would and, um, and change their... Back to finding that one that's passionate for learning and training too. Right, right. And I, that's what I don't think the companies do. I don't think they actually look at, they say, okay, we've got 10 really great technicians here and and then they'll throw the new hires in with just any one of them without really evaluating what they're you know how well they communicate and how well they train in the field agreed with that being said too um i know we've talked a few of the past forward here as we've gone through some of the ways we can probably improve as businesses um but what would you say are some of maybe perks that we could include past career growth opportunities, you know, pay structures. I know that we talked a lot about flex time and how that, that, 
your career balance with life is a big piece of what interests my generation of employees. Yeah, I think in addition to the ones I mentioned earlier, you know, sign bonuses, um, life insurance premiums, uh, these are some of the ones that I've seen over the last, you know, five, six years. Um, but flexible scheduling, and, and, and I understand that that is very difficult in skilled trades, that flexible scheduling can be can be tough. But it's not insurmountable. It can be done. And uh, there's actually a recent survey that found that 44% of workers would take a pay cut in exchange for a more flexible work schedule, which is pretty amazing when you think about that. Um, you know, balancing family, most of your younger technicians have families or, you know, or soon have families. And if they can take a, you know some time off during the week to attend one of their child's school functions or some personal business and maybe make that time up either either later in the day or possibly on the weekend, it doesn't have to be uh, real crazy. I mean, it can be done. It, it can be done. It, again, it's more challenging in skilled trades than it, than it is in other um, fields. But but I think flexible scheduling, I think you're going to start to see more and more of that actually because it's very attractive, particularly to younger technicians. I agree with that sentiment a lot. Um, I think there was a piece that I had notated on like what I was looking for when I make a career decision. And one of the reasons I'm really glad I landed at Interplay, um, given that, you know, it truly is your work fits into your life, not the opposite. And right. like you said, that's not necessarily always possible in the trades, but if you can lead paths to making it possible, it makes it easier to grab um, individuals of my generation, knowing that there's different things and different priorities that we're competing with and everyone has different competing priorities. So it'd be great for your, you know, um, more experienced technicians too. Um, but it just gives you that leg up on some of the other companies around you probably. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's something that they're going to have to evolve because, the job market is and skilled trades right now the uh they hold that the the hires or the applicants kind of hold all the cards because most have multiple opportunities for jobs um so you need you need to sweeten the pot there to to get them to come on board and it's not just you know medical benefits and salary and, and those things but there's other perks that could be that could be attractive to them definitely and I want to also pause for a live question here that a little bit relates to paths forward. I think from a career growth standpoint, Tim mentioned in the chat, how much time do you typically allow for training during a typical week for newer tradespeople? Learning is lifelong. What does that look like long term? And I know that that may be, you know, slightly out of your wheelhouse, knowing that you were more in the this trade school perspective, but any perspective you can give there would probably be insightful. I, I could. I think that, you know, on the it depends on the level of equipment that they're working on and what they're actually doing. I felt like most of my graduates after two years um, at the college graduating, they could go out on their own on residential equipment. They could handle a residential furnace, air conditioner, heat pump, and, and even some smaller light commercial refrigeration equipment. Um, when they got into the commercial and industrial equipment, most of these larger companies Put them with a technician for six months to a year every day, 40 hours a week plus. Um, they're with us experienced tech every day. Um, so it could be extensive. I mean, the amount of time that they're spending could be a lot. It really depends on the level of equipment. It, it definitely does. And also, I think it, it depends on what worker you probably were able to bring on to, depending right. on if you have to train them from the ground up versus if they're probably coming out of more of a trade school um, type situation where maybe they already have that leg to competency a little bit more, knowing that they've had some hands-on in the classroom. I think you're seeing a lot of that because there simply isn't enough graduates of um, what we call Votech centers and trade schools and community colleges in my area. Um, so employers are kind of forced to hire some with no no experience, no background, no formal training at all. And that's a challenge. Um, I'm not saying that can't be done. It's just a lot more challenging than when you have somebody who at least has some fundamentals under their belt. And this might be uh, throwing a question at you that we haven't talked about at all. So I'm interested to hear your answer. But um, in saying that, if there was a business that maybe because we don't have enough students in the classroom that we can grab for, you know, the open positions we have. So we have to hire someone and hire them for their attitude to train for aptitude. 
what does what would you say that looks like from your perspective? How could we get them to competency using different channels, knowing that there's many that we can get there with? I think, you know, in addition to having a good technician, have partnering them with a good technician every day, um, and they're going to phase out of that. In other words, <clears throat> they're not going to be with that technician for six months or a year, and then just they're out on their own. It doesn't work like that. They'll start putting them out on their own and seeing how they perform um, at that point. But online education, manufacturers, literature, all those things are really, really important. I think the Interplay product really allows companies to kind of keep track of a student's progress or a new hire's progress. I have a lot of uh, smaller companies in my area that are using using this product. They've been using it for a long time and um, they're really, really happy with it. And they can watch the progression of their technicians. And most of them have told me that it, it's amazing how fast uh, they've developed competency in the field when they've gone through the program. Um, they get out there, they, they tend to reach competency a lot sooner than somebody who is just out there with a technician every day because they're, I guess they're learning the fundamentals and, you know, the theory really does count for something. Um, you know, the hands-on portion is great, but you've got to have that, that theory when it comes to, uh, skill trades, whether it be electrical or mechanical or, you know, uh, thermodynamics, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, that's yeah. why I was saying. We're, we're not trying to get rid of the textbook. We know it's important, but the one thing with textbooks is you got to make sure there's some digital level to them too, because of the transparency and knowing that we spoke to how fast the industry is changing, how many different paths there are to being in the industry. Um, and how many different things might change by tomorrow that it's already outdated. Um, so that's probably a, a challenge point that I'm sure a lot of you guys are facing in the industry as well. So feel free to, to notate that if, if that is a challenge for you. Um, I really liked uh, his comment, the yeah. three A's. I was about to make a point of that too. one too. Really, really good. I couldn't agree more. Attitude I think and atti attitude, attitude and communication skills, both written as well as verbal communication skills, are just as important, if not more important, than technical ability at the at entry level. There's no question about that. Cool. And I also would like to notate Kevin. Um, he let Tim and I know that it's really important to see if your technicians are visual or hands learning and what fits them best. And I think that that's a really um, interesting note and a very tactical note too. Um, I am a super visual learner. And so I learn through seeing things on a screen or seeing things in person. Um, but knowing that about your technician obviously can help be able to hire for attitude and then train for that aptitude to succeed. I agree with that. And again, I think the a lot of the online training out there can can assist with that as well. Cool. I 100 percent agree. And I know that we're getting towards the end of our time here and I don't want to take too much of anyone's lunch. So I do want to plug our next webinar on um, November 17th. Frank Garo will be speaking. He's a plumbing expert. He'll be speaking towards um, how you can upskill and cross train to create technicians that are more confident and profitable. So really making sure that now we've we've retained them in speaking with Krista, we've attracted them in speaking with Tim. How do we then take someone and upskill them, cross train them? Um, and Frank has a really cool perspective on that as a business owner and teacher himself in how he was able to promote um, a positive learning culture and how to upskill and cross train his professionals to the point where they're very loyal. Um, so I think that that's a really cool piece of knowledge that he can drop and I hope everyone can join that. Um, but I wanted to plug that before we get into Q and A. So feel free to send in some questions. We have a couple more that we'll answer, but like I said, I don't want to take too much of everyone's time knowing that we had 45 minutes slotted. So feel free to stick around for some questions if you have the time. Um, and also if you have questions that we didn't get to, or you want to speak to someone here at Interplay, feel free to reach out to us via email as well, or be on the lookout for that replay tomorrow. Um, but one question that we did get from Kelsey in the chat, um, more in the Q&A side, that I didn't know where it quite fit in, but I think it's a good one to answer, is as a middle manager, how can I convince my boss that hiring and training incentives are important? And I know that that's like a, 
a little niche question. So um, feel <laughs> free to give us that if you know the answer. <laughs> It, it's that's a that can be a struggle. Um, I mean, you've got to have some data to support to support that when you're going to the powers that be. If you're middle management, some way of proving that uh, you know, or you're just going to put your neck out and hope that it say I'll guarantee you know that it improves things. Um, but it's it's very difficult to convince. Particularly someone, and I think I mentioned how, you know, and I don't, I don't say it's a generational thing, but I've noticed here locally, a lot of the companies where the children took over the company and they have a completely different attitude about training and they're much more receptive to it. Um, I think a lot of um, in the past, that wasn't the case. And again, I've been 30 years at it and I've seen how it's evolved and it's a uh, it's really good that it has evolved, but I, I, I just think that the um, the younger generation of business owners um, see that I get they see they see more opportunities for that than than perhaps their their parents did. And that's not necessarily true in every case. But in my experience, that's what I see here locally. Agreed. And I think that. We, we talked to data being important, but also knowing that training is a huge push. So how can we find that data if we can? And if not, how can we still anecdotally show that it's very important? Well, you, you, could, you know, you can kind of tell them what their competition is doing um, if they're one upping them, especially and, and, you know, hiring employees and training employees. Um, I, again, it's, it's difficult to convince someone you've, you've got to be able to prove that it's going to, that it's going to be successful. Agreed. And I think Kristen's note is probably a good one for us to, to land on. Like I said, in the chat, feel free to reach out with any more questions you might have for Tim or to get in touch with us. Um, but succession planning is critical. Businesses must help educate parents on the profitability of the trades industry, as well as the career opportunities for their kids. And I think that is a really important piece of attracting skilled workers is we have to find a way to get more skilled workers. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I appreciate uh, the chat, Tim. This has been really insightful and we had some really great conversation in the chat. So I know a lot of people have uh, found it beneficial as well. Um, but I will make sure everyone gets this recording tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Thank you.